Hi, uh, my name is Andrew. I'm one of the pastors at the Livingham Church, and it's great to have you with us for our Sunday service. I wonder if you've ever asked yourself this question, am I really a Christian? I asked myself that a lot when I was younger growing up. Um, I was sent to Sunday school from a really early age. My parents um, sent me along. I'm so thankful for that. Uh, right at the beginning of my school life, I, I can remember the smiles of the women who taught me when I was really young, the men who taught me when I was a lot older, just people that I thought, wow, I want what they have. They just seem to be so incredible. And I honestly look back at my time at Dungannon Presbyterian Church with so much joy. Um, I was captivated by Jesus right from the beginning. And I wanted to go to heaven uh, to be with him. I wanted to follow him. Uh, I'm not sure where it was that I learned about a thing called the sinner's prayer, but I must have prayed that thing loads of times periodically growing up in my early days um, uh, in primary school. I really look back um, at that time and I'm not sure when it was that I that it really worked or that something really did start in my life, but I, I prayed that prayer so often that it usually began Lord, I'm not sure if it worked last time, but I really mean it this time. And then I would go on to pray something about, Lord, I'm a sinner and I know that I need you and please forgive me. And I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me and I want to accept that gift of eternal life. And, and I want to follow you for the rest of my life. You know, something like that. Um, I do remember one time, though, I was about nine or ten. I remember lying on my bed, um, looking out my blinds into our front garden in um, our place just outside of Dungannon. And I remember saying, Lord, I really mean this. Like, I'm so serious about this. I'm yours and I'm following you. And I am sorry for the wrong things that I've done. And I do believe that Jesus died for me. Please forgive me. That's kind of when I look uh, back as, uh, as when it really um, took off for me. But I, oh, even still, I wasn't quite sure if it had worked. And um, I didn't know where to go in the Bible to find out whether it had worked. Um, it wasn't until I was probably about 13, I was taking communion in our church for the first time. It was a big deal to go to classes, to get prepared uh, to do that. And the minister would meet up with us one on one um, before we did that, just to make sure that we knew what we were doing and that he was happy that something had happened in us. And that's really when I got that assurance, I could say, that I really was saved, that I was a Christian. Um, he really helped point that out to me, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, it is important to know, and it does take somebody who's maybe an older Christian, somebody who's been a Christian for longer, to really come alongside and to help you, uh, or me, uh, as it was, to, to know or understand what it is to be a Christian. It's so important to know. And you might be listening to this, and you aren't sure. Well, maybe this talk will help you. Um, we're turning back to the book of First Thessalonians and we're in chapter one and we're about to learn about the people who'd become Christians in such a short period of time. Paul had only been, if we find out from the book of Acts, he'd only been there maybe between two weeks or four weeks maximum and yet people had become Christians having maybe never heard about Jesus ever before that point in time. Um, so Paul writes this letter. It's this massive ministry of letter writing that forms a lot of our New Testament. And this is a letter of assurance. And so you see this language really strongly. Let's read our verses for this morning. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And we're going to start at verse, verse 4. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because... Our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. Not, for not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and in Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, 
and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. These verses show us what it is to be a genuine Christian. Do you see that as we were reading? In our culture today, this is more necessary than ever because sometimes people, especially here in, in Scotland, feel that we're Christians or live in a Christian country because uh, this has historically been a Christian country or maybe because they went to church when they were really young and uh, maybe they have a belief in God. They might be God-fearers, we could say. Well, do you want to check yourself? Well, let's divide up our passage and see what we can learn. First of all, we have God's initiative. The sentence in verse four starts with the, the word for, uh, and having looked at the previous verses, uh, we could say that this is the headline for the rest of this chapter. The people who've become Christians are God's. What a reassurance to them. They are loved by God. They are his chosen people. And that's to say that God has initiated this amazing work among the Thessalonian people. It was God, remember, who stopped Paul in his tracks when he was on the way to Damascus to find, to imprison or kill Christians. It was God who gave Paul a vision when he was on a second missionary journey, going and checking up on some of the churches from the first missionary journey and led him to Macedonia, closed the door for him to go to other places and opened the door for him to go to Macedonia to preach. We can say with complete certainty that God has wanted to move among these Thessalonian people and Macedonian people. It's God's initiative to reach them. And if you've become a Christian, you need to be reassured that God loves you and he has chosen you. God has a massive part to play when we become a Christian. He initiates it. But then we come on to the gospel advance. And I'm going to explain what that word gospel is later on, um, if you can bear with me. But reminding ourselves, um, verses five to eight, we can see loads of faith language and we can see loads of love language. If we were to plot the journey here, Paul preaches to the Thessalonians. And we find out last time in the book of Acts that that happened principally in Jewish synagogues. Uh, so there has to have been a clear message. And we find out from Acts chapter 17 that it was a message about Jesus, about his death and about his fulfillment of the Old Testament part of the Bible. And there's something more. In verse five, we find out that the preaching is accompanied with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. You could say it like this. Paul has a power-filled preaching ministry that was earnest and it was urgent, calling for people to change. But God is also working through him to produce the results. So we would have to say that a ministry of the Word of God and the Spirit of God has made it powerful and people have become saved. This is such a, an assurance, another assurance that Paul gives to them of their genuine Christian beliefs. They have heard the true gospel and God has worked through it. And that should have been reassuring for them. But also they have that little verse that talks about what kind of men we were for your sakes. And so Paul's life is also in line with his preaching. He's not some kind of a fly by night. He's come in here, sees a bit of amazing stuff and then goes off to the next bit because he's bored. Uh, no, um, verse five gives us a glimpse of what is going to come up in the chapters to follow. Uh, so Paul's talk lines up with his walk um, and so much so that the Thessalonian believers imitate him, they copy him. And the word imitate actually in, in the original language of the Greek, it's where we get the word mimic from. Now, my kids love to mimic. They can do loads of different voices from loads of different characters, from loads of different films, and unfortunately, TikTok videos too. They are so skilled at it. But 
the one thing that I really long um, to see in my children, and maybe you do in yours too, is that they would become a Christian and mimic Christian life. Now, I'm relieved to see from our passage that they're not just mimicking one person. That will be a big responsibility. It's not just Paul, it's Paul's team. And it's not just Paul's team, it's Jesus. Oh, I mean, that's a better one to imitate, isn't it? Because, of course, yeah, the Holy Spirit is living in us um, and we should be imitating Jesus, uh, but we should be doing so so that other, actually other people see Jesus. They see the life that Jesus lived. They can read about it for themselves as they learn to follow Jesus, but also they can see that we're putting into practice the things that we're learning too. They should be able to mimic us. Now, we'll find out more about what they were mimicking um, in Paul in this short letter. But let's start with what we see here. They're mimicking someone who shares their faith and somebody who God uses with great power. Now, would you recommend to others that they follow your example? Would you be a good example to follow? These Thessalonian believers follow Paul's evangelistic example. But in verse six as well, they also suffer just like Paul's team. They have had much affliction, yet they have the joy of the Holy Spirit. So they have joy in the middle of suffering, in spite of suffering. And this is another mark of genuine Christianity. You don't just chuck it when the going gets bad. And we can think about the parable of the seeds and the sower and the soils, where when things do get difficult, the, the seed gets choked or the seed gets eaten or the seed gets scorched. Joy isn't the absence of suffering and suffering isn't always the mark of God's displeasure. We need to learn quickly in our Christian lives that it's not all joy with no affliction. No, we actually have a mixture of both. And that makes it difficult, but we can still have joy from God in the midst of our afflictions. And we don't just jettison it when the going gets tough. So the Thessalonians hear from Paul. They follow Paul's example. And all of a sudden we see from the passage that people in other regions start noticing and imitating them. And so we have Macedonia, and that's where Thessalonica was, and also where Philippi was. And then we have Achaia, which is a region to the south going towards Athens, which is where Paul moved on into. So I love this. I just love this. The Thessalonian people are so incredible. The word of the Lord, and it says here, sounded forth in verse 8 from you in Macedonia and Achaia. Now, that word sounding forth should give us the image of bells. I want you to have in your mind this idea of ringing bells. Now, bells usually chime at the end of, of church or a wedding. It's happened at the end of wars. It's happened to celebrate special national occasions. It's a picture of joy. And I don't know if you've ever heard um, church bells, but you, those things carry for miles. They, they can rise amongst the din of traffic or other countryside noises. Um, it's, it's the image of the sounding out of good news from that church in Macedonia. It's intense. It echoes where it spreads. This is the fruit of genuine faith in Jesus. And, and it must have been so encouraging for Paul to hear all about it. Because Paul had preached to the Thessalonians, the Thessalonians heard, now they preach to others, and now the word gets back from the others that Thessalonian people have been preaching to. He didn't tell them to do it, but they mimicked him. And it's been the honest and natural evidence of genuine faith. But you know, I wonder, what it might look to us if we were able to time travel some of those Thessalonian Christians into our church here in Wallyford, here now. Thankfully, we would have George to translate for us. But how would they fit in? Would we think that they were radicals, that they were going too far, that they were too on fire? Would they be disappointed in us? Would they fit right in? Would their joy and their passion infect us? Would Wallyford be blown away by them and us? It's 
an interesting question. Well, we've had God's initiative and we've looked at the gospel advance, but now let's look at the gospel response. I know I've used this word so many times, gospel, gospel, gospel. It's such a common word in our churches that we almost forget that some people listening will not realise what that word means. Literally, in Old English, it means good news. Uh, it's another word that we would say for the good news that God loves us and has done something about it. Uh, the gospel is the truth that God is holy and we are not. The gospel is the story that we have disobeyed God and that we have sinned. And yet God loves us so much and he doesn't want us to be separated from him that he sent God the Son. God the Father sends God the Son into the world. God the Son lives a perfect life. Christ lives a perfect life that we could never live and was cruelly killed on a cross. And on that cross, he took the wrath of God, the punishment for sin that should have been ours. He died. He was buried, but he rose again. His sacrifice for us worked. God the Father accepted his sacrifice. But now the gospel is you need to respond. Well, how will you respond? Let's look at verse 9 and remind ourselves about how the Thessalonians responded. And then it might help you to know how you can respond too. They themselves report, these are the other Christians who become Christians because of the Thessalonians. They themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. You see, these Thessalonians turned to God from idols. They've been worshipping false gods. And this is an indication to us that there were probably far more Greeks became Christians than Jewish people became Christians. And these Greek folks, they, they had their own beliefs, they had their own customs, they had their own um, religious practices, and yet they turned their back on those things, they leave them behind, and they turned, which is a picture of repentance. Um, turning away from idols, turning towards God. That's what repentance is. And, and they turned and they served God. Now, once they might have brought offerings or sacrifices to their false gods. And if you know anything about the Greek gods, that might have been Zeus or Apollo or Poseidon or Demeter, any of the ones that we would have learned about at school. But they turn away from those things and they turn to God. Now, why did they do that? Well, the clue is in verse 9. They turned from something dead to something living, to the living God. They turned from something false to the true God. They've become convinced that Jesus was alive and they've actually risen from the dead. And the gateway was believing in Jesus who had suffered for them. They needed to realise that the only reason why Jesus died was because of sin because of their sin, because of our sin. And here you see that work of faith that resulted in them rejecting their former practices and embracing the true and living God. These idols that were false and dead might have once promised them security or meaning or a place in society or happiness, just like ours might. What, you mean we have idols? Well, of course we do. Our self-image, our pursuit of leisure, anything that occupies our dreams and makes us think that we don't need God for our contentment and happiness is an idol. When we reject them as the sources of our peace and joy and turn to God, we are responding like the Thessalonians. The only way for them to break free from the hold of these idols was to embrace something far better. To embrace Jesus. And if you were to do that too, I wonder what the benefit might be to you. Well, let's finish the chapter and see what the benefit was for them. These Thessalonians were waiting for Jesus to come again. That was their hope language in the peace that when he does, they would be delivered from the punishing wrath to come. 
Listen, that's the same for us. We as Christians believe that Jesus is coming again. And he will sort out this world. And that means that there is wrath to come. There is punishment to come because there is a sorting out that needs to be done. And wrath is, is the just and exacted punishment of God on sin. It does, it's not an overreaction, an over anger. It is a just and exacted punishment on sin. But if you're a Christian, then you don't need to worry. You don't need to worry in the slightest about you. But if you aren't a Christian, then you might be robbed of the joy that you think that you have now. Do you see the implications? Don't you want to travel the same road as the Thessalonians did? I pray so. And it's a life that I pray we would all want to keep cultivating in ourselves. And you can be sure so I'm going to pray now and I would just invite you, if you want to follow Jesus, if you want to be sure, why don't you pray along with me? Let's pray together, shall we? Lord, a change of life, a change of direction, that's what we all need. And so for those who are listening who are, who are Christians, I pray that this would just really reassure them that this would just help them to see what's happened in their lives and the work that they do for you um, and how we need you to empower what we say when we're trying to get through to other people. Lord, we need your help. And Lord, I really wanna pray for people listening to this that just aren't Christians or Lord, people who've wondered if they are and people who just wanna be sure that they are. Lord, it's become so clear from this passage that we need to know that Jesus died on a cross for our sin and rose again. And because of that, the way to you is open. The door is flung open wide. We can know you, but only if we turn away from our former lives and turn towards you. Lord, that could be at great cost for some people who are listening. It was for many of the Thessalonians. They, they experienced hardship because of it. But Lord, what they embraced was so much fuller, so worth it, that they believed that that was an important thing to do and the right thing to do. And I just pray for those listening who may be fearful about COVID-19, who may be fearful about what would happen to them when they die. I pray that even just looking at this, that they might realize that they need you. And Lord, you are coming to sort things out but that means you're going to come and sort us out. So Lord, we need to have our sin forgiven so that we can be spared the wrath to come and dedicate our lives to following you now. Because the hope that that would give us, Lord, would change us here and now to help us bring that message to others first and foremost, but also to be a blessing everywhere we go. And so I really pray, help us as we want to put these things into practice, as we want to try to live in a way that the Thessalonian people did. And Lord, just be a, a resounding bell. Lord, a, a, an amazing, amazing resounding noise of joy and conquest, Lord, that might go across this land, that might go towards our neighbours and our families and help them to realise the joy of what it is to know you. Lord, thank you. Thank you that we've been able to look into this passage today. And I pray that you will bless all listening. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us and God bless you this week.